should I just begin? Thank you, Joe. Um, so, hello. Can can you hear me? Um, so, my uh, assignment here uh, was to talk about uh, applications of ADS-CFT to uh, kinetic matter physics, and uh, I want to begin by assuring you that I'm taking my assignment very seriously. And uh, although it may come to your attention as we're as as the discussion develops that I'm not really talking about like D brains and black holes and the bulk and all these things as much as you might have thought I would. Um, I really am taking my assignment seriously. And a comparison which I uh, I've been keeping in mind uh, to explain you know how it is that nevertheless I'm taking taking my assignment seriously is is the following. It's maybe a little bit immodest, but um, uh, so there's this this famous uh, quote from uh, the great accelerator physicist uh, Robert Wilson when he was uh, uh, at a congressional hearing uh, about whether or not uh, 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 Fermilab would be funded, and uh, one of the congressmen asked him, "Well, uh, what you know, what good would it do for uh, for the uh, national defense?" And his answer was, uh, "It." Uh, it has nothing at all to do with the national def with the with the defense of the country, uh, except to make the country worth defending. And uh, uh, so, just to, so to to be very clear about what I mean, uh, what I'm going to say in these lectures has okay, maybe not nothing at all, but maybe not that much to do with uh, ADS-CFT. Uh, using ADS-CFT to to study condensed matter physics, um, except to make condensed matter physics worth attacking. Okay, so that's that's my plan. We'll see if it works. Uh, um, okay, and uh, okay, so let me let me uh, begin with some context. So it's it's a very general context. The the kinds of systems I'm going to be talk, talking about, might, you might call them quantum systems with extensive degrees of freedom. And by extensive here, I mean the following picture. Um, uh, I guess it's best to draw a picture here. So here's a picture. And uh, the picture you should have in mind, I'm okay. I, I'm drawing an unfortunately regular lattice, but that's not actually so important of a feature of what I'm saying. Uh, there's a bunch of patches of space. So each of these little things I want you to think of as a patch of space, and uh, they 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 have some location. So this is some some direction x, and uh, there's some set of quantum degrees of freedom associated to each patch of space. So here I'm telling you that the Hilbert space, calligraphic h is a tensor product over these patches of space labeled x of uh, some Hilbert space associated to each patch of space, okay, which I'll call h sub x. It's finite dimensional. I will call the dimension of this local Hilbert space n squared for reasons that you'll see in a minute. And, uh, so, and then uh, we're going to couple them together with some Hamiltonian, which is some sum over those patches. Maybe it can involve some neighboring patches also. This is an eraser. That's not useful. Uh, <laughs> are there, is there color? Let's see. I guess there's white and yellow. That, that'll work. Okay, so maybe you know one of these terms in the Hamiltonian involves uh, several of these patches at once, but but it's it's localized near one of these patches, and its support falls off rapidly. So it's a sum of terms like this, uh, uh, which are repeated in a pattern. They're not necessarily all the same, but I want you to think of this as a a Hamiltonian motif, All right? So it's like one of these repeated patterns. It's not necessarily exactly the same. There can be development, uh, but uh, it uh, uh, there aren't places in the world where really crazy things happen. That's an important assumption of what I'm going to say. And uh, a useful uh, thing to keep in mind about this picture. So this is not a very good depiction of what I'm going to say, but uh, I want you to imagine uh, the kinds of systems we're going to talk about as, uh, uh, as like a lawn made of sod. So that each of these little patches is like one of these, these, these chunks of, of uh, grass rug, you know, that people use when they're, trying to, when they're trying to make a lawn in a place where there shouldn't be a lawn. 
And you know, they, 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 this part, this step of defining the system is, is spreading the sod on the ground, and this part of the system is coupling together the patches of sod to form a lawn. Okay? So this is, this is a metaphor which I, which I find useful. And so, you know, really, re but really what I'm saying, what I'm talking about is a regulated quantum field theory. Uh, like you might, you might imagine that really we're interested in some continuum where this becomes small and the number of sites becomes large. Uh, but maybe not. Um, we'll see. So, and I guess also it's important, it'll be important that there's an infrared regulator so that the total number of sites is finite and the total number of sites is this number over this number to some power, which is the number of dimensions. Okay, so that's, that's the context. And this is very general, of course. It describes uh, most of physics, maybe. Um, and uh, sometimes, given these ingredients, we can figure out what the system does. Um, and uh, usually when we can do that, it's because it's a bunch of harmonic oscillators. Right? It may not be obvious it would, uh, how, to, how to find the right normal modes, how to find you know, in which set of variables those harmonic oscillators will decouple from each other. But uh, uh, sometimes it's a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And uh, I want to talk about what to do when that's not the case. And when is that not the case? And you know, there, there are a few techniques in bet uh, besides uh, finding normal modes and ADS-CFT. There are a few things in between, but uh, well, we'll see what we can do. Okay, so maybe, uh, uh, so if it's not harmonic oscillators, then what do we do? Maybe we do ADS-CFT. Um, and, you know, because ADS-CFT is a very powerful tool, it's, uh, you know, it solves certain strong, strongly coupled field theories um, in terms of classical, sometimes, in terms of some cl simple classical set of variables in one higher dimension. And all you need to do to, to understand what the field theory does is solve some simple wave equations. It's, it's really wonderful when it works. And uh, so we need to talk a little bit about when it works. OK. Um, so which systems can we try to solve this way? And uh, I guess I might call this blackboard. Oh, I'm in the black hole. Ah. OK. Yeah, it's a two-sided black hole. OK. Uh, so this is limitations of classical holography. Holography. Um, and I'm emphasizing this word classical because I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't want to impugn the value of ADS-CFT. It's a wonderful thing. But for the you know, kind of wonderful fantasy scenario I was just describing where you solve a strongly coupled condensed matter system just by solving a wave equation, it's important that the, that the, that the gravity theory is simple. It's, impor it's important that you can just you know, set to specify some boundary conditions and initial conditions and solve oh, a differential equation. And so that's, that's what I mean by classical here. And so when is it classical? And uh, uh, maybe the, I'm not going to review uh, ADS-CFT here. I guess, I guess Joe out did this already a few weeks ago. Yeah, so you guys all know this. Uh, so uh, gravity is classical. No, gravity uh, uh, means large n squared, where n squared is that n squared up there. Um, and so let me, let me remind you why, why that's true. Um, this is, uh, you know, ADS-CFT is, is a wonderful example of, of the holographic principle in action. Um, and as such, it it's, it's, uh, uh, satisfies it. <laughs> and so what I mean by this is, so the holographic principle, the sort of quantitative version of it, uh, principle of quantum gravity is, uh, is the statement that the number, let's say the maximum entropy, let's say it this way, the area of the boundary in units of Planck mass to the right number of powers, so this is uh, of quantum gravity, holographic principle of quantum gravity, it's like the only thing we know about quantum gravity maybe, uh, is that its Hilbert space is not just a tensor product like this. It's, so the, yeah, I guess the, the, the most emphatic way I should say this is that in a theory of quantum gravity, the Hilbert space is not like that. That's the thing we know about it. But ra and rather, uh, the maximum entropy uh, goes like, let's, let's put a little twiddle, goes like the area of the boundary. Whereas the maximum entropy of this kind of system goes like the volume. And so what do I mean by the maximum entropy? It's uh, uh, the maximum entropy of state is if I just don't know anything at all, Right, so that's the log of the total number of states 
is the, this is the biggest the entropy can be, what's the total number of states? Well, that's uh, each site can have, uh, OK, this is the dimension of uh, each site can have n squared, isn't, can be in n squared states. And there are how many sites? There's, uh, yeah, let's just say the number of sites here. All right, and so the log of that number is, did I get it wrong? Oh, OK. Here, let's just say number of states per site. OK. Mm -hmm. This is in, yeah, inside the log. The total number. Yeah. Um, no, because uh, the number. Of the, sorry, yeah, my notation is bad. So this is the number of sites uh, times the log of the number of states per site, right? Sorry, that's my bad handwriting. Okay, and so uh, wait, what? What the heck just happened here? The number of sites is in the exponent. Yeah, OK. Right, so this is L over epsilon. That's the, that's the number of sites in each dimension. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's inside the log. Um, so the number of sites is L over epsilon to the D times this number, which depends on the, on the number of states per site. It's actually, I guess it's the log of n. Damn. It's even worse than I thought, huh? Yeah. Oh, OK. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I can make my point even more dramatically. This is e to the n squared. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. That was silly. Yeah. So this is, this is the log of that number, which is n squared. There we go. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I was, sorry, I was, I was underselling my point there. All right, so, uh, I've, so this, is the, this is the number of states per site in, a, sorry, this is the maximum entropy of one of these systems. And if we're going to equate that with the theory of gravity, we should set that equal to the area of, ba of the boundary of the space in which the gravity theory is living uh, in, in, in Planck units. And uh, OK, my handwriting gets worse as I get lower, so maybe I'll go over here. Uh, um, so, so, this, so let's compare that to the holographic answer. There we go. So ADS has a metric which looks like this. Z squared, so Z is some here. Okay, let me draw this picture so we can pretend I'm doing ADS CFT. Um, this direction is Z. Here's uh, these, they're D of these spatial directions. This is a picture at fixed time, which is what we should do if we want to count degrees of freedom. So let's erase that guy. This is ADS. Oh, and there's some length I should write here, which let me call it R ADS squared. And uh, uh, okay, and then uh, so what's the area of the boundary of this sort of uh, Poincaré upper half plane? Well, it's infinity, um, and that's because I didn't put in these regulators yet. So one regulator is easy. That's just this one, making these d spatial dimensions. There are d of these. Uh, put them in a box. And the, the other one is a little more subtle, t subtle and I need you to remember things that Joao told you, uh, which is that we stop the boundary at some distance from, we stop the space time at some distance from the boundary, which is, uh, this is uh, z equals epsilon. I shouldn't write equals here, because this is not a, a precise relation. But uh, making this, this epsilon finite uh, has the same purpose as making this epsilon finite. and. Uh, it has the same outcome, too, because if we compute the area of the boundary, I, OK, it would be, I think it would be wrong for me to write the 4. Um, uh, this is an integral over fixed t and z equals epsilon of square root of g over uh, 4g newton. And. Uh, OK, everybody can take the square root of that g. It's just z to the right power. It's, um, uh, oh, and, and this is an integral over the spatial dimensions. And so this is l to the d 
from these integrals just go up to L. And this thing gets evaluated at epsilon. And so that's epsilon to the minus d. And then there's some bunch of powers of R ADS, uh, which is the right number of powers, and a factor of g newton. OK? Right, so that's, uh, I just took this metric and found the, the volume element on a slice at fixed time and fixed, uh, fixed z and evaluated that area. And OK, so let's organize that. That's L over epsilon to the d that you recognize from over there and times R ADS over G Newton to the D, uh, R ADS to the D over G Newton. And uh, so this is the same on both sides. And so if we want these things to, to be equal, we'd better set this thing equal to this thing. Uh, and so you see G Newton goes like 1 over n squared. OK? So small Newton's con constant. Uh, which is the limit where the thing becomes classical, uh, means that the number of degrees of freedom right, each one, on each one of these patches of sod is really ginormously large. Right? That is the control parameter, which makes the gravity theory classical. OK, is everybody happy with that? My handwriting will get better, maybe. <laughs> um, OK, and, uh, and so yeah, so e to the n squared is, is pretty big. It's actually, I, I can't believe I got, I got that wrong, because it's. You know, now I'm even sadder about the whole thing. Um, because you know, th this is a strange situation to be in. It means that a, a system which has a classical gravity dual is sort of twice in the thermodynamic limit. Because you know, it has, if I take this L, the size of the space big, it puts it in the thermodynamic limit. Like that's usually the way, that's the way I reach the thermodynamic limit. I don't know about you. Um, but this kind of system, even if L is finite, even if you put it in a tiny box and put it in your pocket, this, if, if you want to make gravity classical, you have to take this N large. And that means that even a, a small patch of it can be in the thermodynamic limit, which means that it can, for example, have sharp phase transitions, which uh, maybe you heard about some of these already. In uh, uh, They happen, for example, in studying the entanglement entropy of subregions, if you maybe did somebody talk about this? There's a picture that looks like this. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Something like that. If you don't know what I mean, then never mind. But um, there's a, it's an example of, of a sharp phase transition of such a system, even, even if it's in finite volume, even if, even if um, uh, which, is, which is something that just shouldn't happen if the number of degrees of freedom at each side is finite, because the partition function is just a, a polynomial. Um, OK, so that's, that's weird, and it's a strange starting point for, for doing physics. And so, that, so the main conclusion that I, I draw from this discussion, both uh, in this series of lectures and in my own life, is, is the following. Is that if you want to know which, to which systems we might try to apply these techniques uh, to learn something about condensed matter physics or about uh, you know, these kinds of uh, SOD models, um, well, the, the situations where it will be most useful is when we're the most desperate, is when the, uh, anything else that we might do to try to solve it is basically totally useless. And so we're willing to begin with this crazy approximation. All right, so yes, please. Uh, I like what you said about the thermodynamic limit twice. But sort of, I, I feel like when I'm really doing usual thermodynamic limits, I really need 10 to the 23 or whatever degrees of freedom. Do you? Or maybe, <laughs> maybe 10 to the lot. Well, th that was that was my <laughs> first comment. My second comment is that when we talk about large n for something like a gauge theory, mm -hmm. sometimes we try to apply it to n equals three. Yeah, yeah. Which is pretty far away from the thermodynamic limit, and yet we hope it's still applicable to some reasonable accuracy. Yeah, that's a good point. And so, so actually, this is a it's an important distinction between trying to use these methods to study kinetic matter physics and trying to use it to study the vacuum of gauge theory, because in the vacuum, you're sort of tamping down all these degrees of freedom at each point, right? in the sense that you know, you're putting them in their ground state and trying to leave them alone. Whereas we're going to be interested in putting some extensive amount of stuff, right? where you know, allowing the stuff at each point to get excited. I think I could less, less easily get away with a smaller n in that yeah, case. I think so. I think so. Um, wait, wait, hold on. Are you saying that the, gra the classical gravity is good at, at n equals 3? I don't think you are. 
No, no. Yeah, no, you're no. saying that it's I that so, so a solution at large n of the ga vacuum the of the gauge of, theory of says n things about finite. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Because uh, we may have a kinetic matter system that is also maybe not n in the thermodynamic limit, but we might still hope to apply something. Right. So, the, so the the real point is not actually the value of n so much as this uh, starting point forces an order of limits upon you. Right? It, when you do classical physics, you're taking n to infinity before anything else. For example, before any long time limit, before taking the low temperature limit. So that it's, it's really a question of uh, the order in which the limits are taken. And this one pushes you into a certain corner. And those limits definitely do not commute. Right? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I hope I've lowered your expectations uh, sufficiently and so that, that we can go on. And uh, uh, all right. So I have kind of a crazy plan. Um, We'll see how it goes. Um, the, first, the first item of business is, uh, as you might expect, given what I just said, is to, to classify states of matter according to how desperate we are, uh, to, to learn something about them using you know, any kind of technique as opposed to some, some actually well-posed technique. So, th so here's, maybe here's some uh, attempt at a plan. So classification. Classification, no, no. Uh, classification by desperation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about gauge theory in condensed matter. So that is, how is it that you could get a system like that to be a gauge theory? Uh, so notice that you know, uh, probably everybody here uh, myself included, when I, when, when, you, when I say gauge theory, you know, you think, well, that means that the Hilbert space is defined in terms of some horrible thing with gauge redundancies, and there's gauge symmetries, and things are equivalent to other things, and, okay, so n th notice that that's not at all the case here. Here, I, I can be very clear about who the degrees of freedom are. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there. Nobody's equivalent to anybody else, right? So how can this be a gauge theory? That's a mystery I'd like to try to elucidate. Um, Okay, and then uh, I want to say something about entanglement renormalization, which is, I'm not going to be able to spell that word, okay, um, in, which is the, maybe the closest we co we've come to drawing that picture for starting from there. Uh, and then I, maybe I'll say something about holography without gravity, which is kind of a, well, okay, we'll see. And then, uh, and then I want to talk about the example where we're the most desperate, which is uh, uh, Fermi surfaces. So specifically, I want to talk about um, uh, killing, killing Fermi surfaces, killing the quasi-particles at a Fermi surface in various ways. Um, okay, that's my plan. Um, I, I have some notes that I've written, which uh, I'll try to post to the wiki. That's what I'm supposed to do, right? Um, okay, I haven't done it yet, and uh, I guess I'm going to be really bad about references, but there are references in the notes. And then uh, uh, finally, one one uh, exhortation I have, which is, please, 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 please ask me questions because I don't know what you know, um, and you know, uh, maybe I'll say things that are totally obvious, maybe I'll say things that are totally mystifying. I understand them. I don't know about you, right? <laughs> okay, so please take Oliver's lead. Ask questions. All right, so here's the classification by level of desperation. Uh, maybe I'll number these. Okay, one, two, three, five, and this is one. Okay, so so here, here's a here's a good uh, a quantity which correlates very well with our level of desperation is the following very coarse property of a state of matter, which is what degrees of freedom do we need to include to describe the system at the lowest energies? So that is, at energies below any interesting scales in the Hamiltonian, or, uh, yeah, so this Hamiltonian has some energies in it, and uh, energies below that, below any of those scales, what degrees of freedom do we have to include? So uh, what? Degrees of freedom. Uh, do we need to include at the lowest energies? And uh, there are three three possible answers to this question. 
um, which I guess uh, maybe I'll give them letters. Um, and the first possible answer is none. And the second possible answer is some. And then the third possible answer is a lot. Okay, And desperation increases in this direction. <laughs> All right, that's, that's my classification of states of matter. Um, OK, that's it. We can go home. Um, you know, maybe I'll say a little more. Um, let's, to say a little more, let's assume translation invariance for a moment. So here, you know, I drew this lovely, obviously perfectly periodic uh, two-dimensional lattice. And uh, maybe let's actually assume that I really do have translation invariance, uh, discrete translation invariance for now. And so that means I can label the states by a momentum. Right? I, I guess it's actually, a, if it's only a discrete translation invariance, it's only a quasi-momentum. Uh, but uh, within the Brillouin zone, I can pretend that it's really a momentum. And we can really use this as a label. And so when I say none, uh, let's see. So here, what I mean by none is, uh, is that the system has a gap, has an energy gap. So that is to say, delta E, which is the energy of the first excited state minus the energy of the ground state, uh, is strictly positive. And that means that below that energy, there's just absolutely nothing. Right? It's just a theory of a single state. The Hilbert space is one-dimensional. Nothing to say. Um, well, it's not, quite, it's not quite that simple. Um, uh, and so now I need to say what I mean. So this, you know, this statement looks really innocent. But let me emphasize that I mean this even in the thermodynamic limit, and I mean even in the ordinary thermodynamic limit, even when L goes to infinity. Okay, so this is to be dis to be contrasted with uh, the situation, for example, of the electromagnetic field in vacuum, where uh, you know there are these waves, and the minimum wavelength that fits in the box is something like one over L, and the energy goes linearly with the wave no the wave number. Sorry, the minimum wave number that fits in the box is 1 over L. The energy goes linearly in the wave number. And so this is to be distinguished with that case where, uh, which is this sum answer. Uh, so this is, fit. well, I don't want to say massless particles. Uh, but let me say uh, delta E goes like 1 over L to some power in this case. Right, so that's the case with photons. If you put photons in a box, the energy gap above the first excited state goes like 1 over L. That, that number is 1. <coughs> um, and a way to think about this case is, uh, is the following. It means that if I draw a picture of the momentum space and draw the spectrum of energies of the state's different momenta, in this case, it looks like this. Right, so this is the picture of uh, the uh, values of the energy that a photon can have. And notice that it goes all the way down to 0. And at 0 momentum, there's a special point of momentum space, which is 0 momentum, where, where there's gapless degrees of freedom. And that's to be distinguished with this case, where the dispersion relation, if there is one, of the excitations looks more like this. Right? Uh, so this is the delta E I, of which I speak, which is finite. And I guess the effect of having a finite box means that rather than lovely smooth curves, these are just isolated points. And in the thermodynamic limit, what happens is just that this fills it. OK. Um, so the distinction I'm making between here and here is, is basically that here I mean a system with massive particles. And here I mean a system with massless particles. So this is. These are the two cases I've spoken about so far. Now, more generally, the excitations, uh, especially here, are not necessarily particles. So that is, you all know that there's a thing called a conformal field theory, where the spectrum of excitations instead has some kind of horrible power law singularity. Maybe it looks like this. Right? I don't know. I think. I think you can get it to look like that. I don't know. Maybe that's forbidden. Okay, definitely you can get it to look like this, <laughs> where there's some sort of uh, cuspy thing there. Um, so you know, e goes like k to some awful number, which is how you get some awful number there. Um, and the excitations are not necessarily particles. Um, okay, and so so you know, this is so the, here I, I'm referring to the possibility that there can be CFT. 
OK, and so this is a little bit uh, harder than this case, right? To, just, to, to write an effective field theory for these degrees of freedom is a little bit harder, right? That's the study of conformal field theory. An effective field theory for these degrees of freedom is maybe not so bad, right? Because if you don't have this, if you, if you have less than delta E worth of energy, nothing can, you can't make anything propagate, right? So that's how, sim how, how hard could that be? Um, but nevertheless, you can imagine that there is something interesting. You could imagine that there's a, well, OK. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll, come back to, I'll come back to the something interesting that can happen there in a minute. But then finally, I need to talk about the a lot case. And the a lot case happens in, in the following way. Here, the, ex the gapless excitations, the, the excitations with zero frequency, all happen at isolated points in momentous space. So just at k equals 0, maybe they're not always at k equals 0. They, in, in a lattice model, they could be at k equals pi or something. But just at isolated points. And that's to be distinguished from a case where the spectrum looks like this. Where all in here, there's stuff. Okay, And so this point here is usually called 2kf. And how do you get this picture? Well, a way to get this picture is if you take free fermions and uh, put a whole bunch of them in the same place, period. <laughs> um, really, so, so you know, here is, so let's think about the case where uh, there is more than, say there's two dimensions, and suppose that the problem is also rotation invariant. That's not so important, but it'll make it, okay, it's nearly rotation invariant. It's easy, it's easy to draw nearly rotation invariant things. Uh, then, uh, we fill these levels of the fermions, and we can make cheap excitations by taking one of these guys, that guy there, and we can put it here. And then we make an excitation whose momentum above the ground state is that, right? That's somewhere here. We can make an excitation, we could put it here instead. Right? That's like here. And then the biggest momentum you can, ha you can have for free is if you take one here, from here, just below, and you put it all the way, all the way on the other side, just above. Right? So that's, that's why it stops at 2kf, where I guess I should have said the radius of this little ball is the Fermi momentum, kf. OK, and so uh, in the case of free fermions, we understand this pretty well. Uh, in the case of uh, systems which are adiabatically connected to free fermions, which is Lando Fermi liquid theory, we, we also understand it pretty well. But there are some other systems which have this kind of spectrum where there's this whole Fermi surface. I guess that's the important thing I need to say. There's this whole surface, whole locus in momentum space, which I'm making wiggly here, where there are gapless degrees of freedom. Right? So if I'm able to add a particle, I could just stick it there for free, no energy. It's just, you know. Uh, it's a whole, gap, a whole surface in momentum space which, of gapless degrees of freedom, in contrast to this case where it's just the gapless stuff is just at points. Okay, and so whereas in this case we kind of understand how to, uh, we know a framework for thinking about conformal field theory in, uh, in terms of uh, you know the usual renormalization group. In this case, uh, uh, despite Joe's valiant efforts in 1992 and lots of other people's hard work, we still don't really have a framework for understanding. Uh, non-Fermi liquids, which is the name for uh, a system with a Fermi surface like this, but which is not described by free fermions, which is not adiabatically connected to free fermions. OK, so this is uh, the problem of non-Fermi liquids, which hopefully we'll come back to at the end there. Okay. Yeah, OK, so uh, the best example, actually, the one, the one which most uh, undisputably exists and is kind of, we know, understand a little bit about it, is the half-filled Landau level. Um, so this this is a compressible quantum Hall state, which uh, uh, is uh, that there's some good evidence that there's a Fermi surface. Uh, except, okay, there's there's one small catch, which is that actually it's an insulator, <laughs> whereas you know, the, uh, which is because of the the degrees of freedom which are making up the Fermi surface aren't charged, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's not a Fermi liquid based on based on the spectrum of excitations. Um, th this is so. One second. This is an example which which is kind of understood theoretically and has uh, you know some very clear experiments on its side. Uh, it's not the most famous example, 
Uh, the most famous example is, is the strange metal phase of cuprate superconductors, uh, which, uh, yeah, maybe I'll say more about it if I have to. <laughs> uh, but there, you know, there you can see the Fermi surface in Angular is all photo emission, but uh, like nothing else about the Lando Fermi liquid theory applies to it. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, it's a real it's a, it's a real life thing. Yeah. So unlike many of the things I'll talk about, uh, wait, I thought you guys were string theorists. You're not supposed to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's a real life thing. Yeah. Um, actually, I can I can draw a map. I can draw a map for you of where to find it. Um, here, it's it's. Uh, I can draw it here. It's here. So this this axis is temperature, and this axis is hold op is uh, yeah hold doping. Okay, so. Uh, you take a right at the antiferromagnet, where the antiferromagnet ends, <laughs> and then here's this annoying superconducting dome, which hides all the interesting stuff, and then you take a left, right? So it's, it's here. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's, that's where the strange metal is. Um, so this is, I, I, uh, sorry, it shouldn't be so uh, glib. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a, a sort of a cartoon of a phase diagram of, of, a, of a Cooper superconductor. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so you know, these materials take their name from this part of the phase diagram because of the engineers, because, you know, uh, humans care about being able to have superconductors at high temperatures. But from the point of view of physics, the, really all the interesting things that are hidden behind there. They're, you know, they're visible at temperatures above the superconducting phase transition. And there's some evidence that if you suppress the superconductivity, superconductivity in a field, they continue a little bit lower. Uh, but uh, basically, we're, we're, uh, uh, there's this annoying problem that we're forced to study this thing at, at this kind of finite temperature. Um, all right, I'll say more about that here. OK. Um, I'm going to go through this list again one more, one more time, a little more slowly. Um, okay, so so you know I've been a little bit unfair to uh, to, to case A of systems with a gap, because uh, um, except for a few brave souls, uh, m most of the papers that are posted to the archive in the condensed matter section in strongly correlated electrons or or mesoscopic physics and Hall, and Hall physics uh, are either about free fermions or they're about gap systems. This is a, uh, and this is, this is just a, a statement about, uh, you know, human courage. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot of pressure to, to uh, work on things that you have a chance of understanding. And, uh, and you know, things in this direction are a lot harder. Um, so, but nevertheless, a lot of those things are quite interesting. <laughs> so that's why I, I want to say a little more about that. Um, okay, so so you know, not not all states of matter where there's an energy gap are the same as each other. And in fact, it's that case where we're the best at distinguishing them from each other, because we can make a very sharp notion of when they're different. So let me draw a picture. Okay, not in the book. Let me draw a picture of. Um, the space of couplings, okay? I feel like this is the, the space of, ha the Hamil of Hamiltonians of this kind of form uh, that I wrote here. Um, it's not just two-dimensional. Uh, even if I restrict to some particular s set of allowed interactions between my sod molecules, um, but let me let me draw a two-dimensional slice. Then, uh, okay, suppose A is an example of one of those gap states of matter, and B is another one. What I mean by that statement, that uh, uh, what I mean by that statement is that they are separated by a wall in the space of couplings. 
So although I'm only drawing two dimensions in the space of couplings, this wall completely separates them. That it is, it is co real codimension one in the space of couplings. And on this wall is the place where the gap closes. Okay, so there's a very sharp notion of when two, two gap states of matter are different. Right? It means that you can never get from here to here adiabatically. Right? You could never vary these couplings in this Hamiltonian slowly enough to get from here to here without creating any excitations because the gap closes. Right? So you all know the adiabatic theorem says that the, rate, the speed at which you have to, the slowness with which you have to go is proportional to uh, 1 over the gap. Okay, so, that, so this is a very sharp notion of when they're different. And so this guy here and this guy here, I don't know, so this one is A and this one is A prime. These guys are equivalent, right? So this is an equivalence relation that we've defined on this set space of gapped uh, systems. And so you might like to know, well, what are the equivalence classes? Right, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, you might be a little bit bothered by the idea that in order to tell, according to this definition, that this guy is really different from this guy, I don't know this guy here, you have to show that you know in this quite large dimensional space of possible couplings, there is no way you could ever go from here to here without closing the gap. Right. So the way to establish that these two things are different is not to exhaustively explore every possible path from here to here. Right. That that would be a bad idea. But rather, the, the good idea would be to find some kind of label. Right, some, kind of, some kind of label that you could associate to each of these states, which you know for sure can't change under smooth deformations. Right, something which is equal at each of the points on this side, and equal at each of the points on this side, and is forced to jump when you cross this line. Right, so these words I'm saying are the very definition of topology. And, uh, uh, okay, and so this, uh, find topological labels. On these equivalence classes, okay, and so topology in this context can you know it can ar arise in many different ways. It can arise because of the topology of the space the thing is living on, the topology of the many-body wave function, the topology of some band structure, and it's important to distinguish these things. And I'd like to spend some time uh, unpacking them. Um, okay, so even in this case, which you know I, earlier I tried to convince you was boring. Um, there's something to say because uh, uh, well, there can be, for example, uh, one way in which topology can arise is it could be that the number of ground states, the number of these things that's here, depends on the topology of the space that you put the system on. That's something that can happen, and I'll show you that it can happen. Uh, And uh, in that case, there is actually an interesting theory of those ground states, which is a topological field theory. Right? So, so uh, uh, in that case, there isn't. It's not really a theory of nothing. It's a theory of the ground states. Um, okay. Another thing that could happen is uh, so. Okay. So, for example, okay. I guess I should mention that that case is called topological order. The number of ground states depends on topology of space, right? Whether it's a three-hole donut or a four-hole donut, and uh, and notice that this is this is the reason this is satisfies my criterion is because this number of ground states is an integer, right? The number of ground states of a real physical system uh, is, is an integer, and that integer uh, for sure uh, can't vary smoothly. Um, but if the gap closes, then the number of ground states becomes ill-defined because you know they're all attached to these uh, <coughs> gapless modes, and the number of ground states can change by sucking some of those gapless modes into the ground state. Okay, um, and this is to be distinguished from another case, which is uh, uh, um, well, okay, which is that you could imagine that even if the system is completely boring in the bulk. If you have just a chunk of it like this, if you somehow uh, terminate your lawn with some kind of boundary, right, with some real boundary, you know, here I was kind of imagining periodic boundary conditions, 
But you could imagine that if you make an interface between your lawn and, like, say, the sidewalk, that there could be something that happens there at the interface between those two things. And uh, the reason that you might think this happens is, you know, suppose A is your lawn and B is the sidewalk. Well, in order to get from here to here in space, so, okay, this is called edge modes. In order to get from, here's, here's the picture of space, here's the sidewalk. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so there's, you have to vary some coupling, right? So one of these coordinates is g. Let's say this g is this the coupling I'm varying to get from there to there, and you see g has to, you know, g is going to vary from. I don't know. This is actually let's make it vary a little more sharply than that. Whoa, that's messy. Okay. So suppose g does this. This is g sub a, this is g sub b. You see, in between, it has to cross this scary point where the gap would close if you used that Hamiltonian in the bulk. And so you might imagine that something interesting can happen there. So this, so h sub uh, g star, this is g star, this is g star, uh, would be gapless. OK, so you might imagine that something interesting has to happen there. Um, all right. OK. So now let me talk a little bit about expectations. Um, there's something that, that kind of works in our favor. Um, it's a sort of force in this direction when, when encountering, when trying to you know, make uh, contact with reality. Uh, let's see here. Let's, there's, a, there's a force acting in the vertical direction of this axis of this of this picture which you know we could call it or maybe maybe we could call it pessimism uh, which is which is that uh, your your basic expectation for which if you're handed some random collection of these inter, you know degrees of freedom and interactions your basic expectation if handed such a thing should be that should be this case should be the most boring case and well wh why is that there's sort of a there's a, a bad reason and a good reason. The bad reason is just that if that weren't the case, then we wouldn't think it was boring, <laughs> right? <laughs> if we encountered these things all the time, we would, you know, we would we would be jaded about them. The good reason, though, is is that um, degeneracy in the spectrum of a Hamiltonian is something that requires a, a reason. Even even a, a, a twofold degeneracy in the ground state of a Hamiltonian is something which which is a priori not natural in the sense that you know, suppose I have a Hamiltonian H naught, and it has the property that it has two ground states, one and two. Let me set the ground state energy to zero. Then, if I perturb this Hamiltonian by any operator, let's assume that it's local, so it's still within our space of possibilities, by any operator where, which mixes these two states, by any operator which has a matrix element in between these two states, then Uh, right, so that then this perturbed Hamiltonian does not have that degeneracy. Right, this is I mean basically it's level it's level repulsion that I'm talking about. Um, so this is even for for a twofold degeneracy. In order to have a gapless mode, you need to have like this sort of co coordinated, mo you know, degeneracy that depends on the the, the wave number, uh, which uh, you know probably is because you left out some terms in the Hamiltonian. Now there are some better reasons why this can happen, which is why it does happen, actually. And so, let, and and so, it's worth it's worth trying to enumerate them. So let's let's do that. Um, okay. So the, the the thing I'm trying to convey now is uh, is the following thing: uh, gaplessness needs an explanation. And so what are some examples of an explanation? Well, the simplest one is if you have a if your system has a continuous global symmetry. Actually, let's let's talk about this example a little more. So, you know, how could it how could you enforce the idea that for every delta h you want to add, this vanishes? Well, one way to do it would be if you had some kind of symmetry which related these two these states and you demand that your Hamiltonian preserves the symmetry. 
in that case, it can't act with it can't act within the multiplet, and so all of the, this will be zero for every Hamiltonian that preserves the symmetry. That is a toy example of Goldstone's theorem, which is the general reason that is a general reason to have uh, gaplessness, right? So so this is broken continuous global symmetry. Okay, so that that's a good reason. You all know what Goldstone's theorem is, right? Should we have a quiz? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was derived in week one. Really? I believe so. Yes. Who? By whom? Um, by uh, Raphael. Ah, ah, good, good, good. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, all right. Yeah, good. Okay. The original derivation. The classical one. Ooh, that's not as good as the quantum <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. Well, it's true even quantum mechanically, <laughs> despite what you may hear. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Oh, I see. I see. I see. You didn't mean h bar equals zero. Okay. I see. All right. Very good. Um, all right. So this. So let's regard that as understood, and I mean not just by by us in this room, but also by humans. Uh, so so this is a you know a re. A re I'm not saying that you're not humans. <laughs> um, me, what I mean by this is, if your system is gapless for this reason, then it's kind of boring, right? It's boring in the sense that it's it's uh, uh, even though it's in it's in this box, it's uh, we shouldn't use ADS-CFT to study it. That's what I mean, really. <laughs> okay. Um, a second reason is sort of clear from that picture over there. If uh, you know some giant hand takes a piece of chalk and tunes the parameters of the Hamiltonian so that it ends up on this wall of critical points where the gap closes, then it'll be gapless. Right? So notice that this involves some external agency of some, of some kind of, or another to carefully uh, tune the parameters of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so maybe it was an experimenter carefully tuning some knob on the experiment. Maybe it was the anthropic principle, carefully selecting for humans. Don't know. OK, so these are examples. Um, the, third, the third case is a little more dramatic. It's continuous, continuous, unbroken gauge invariance. OK, so here what I mean is photons, or gauge bosons. Yeah, let's just say photons. Um, photons are massless particles. There's a good reason they can't get a mass because of gauge, gauge invariance. Right? Um, actually, uh, there's a paper from last December that claims that this is a special case of this for the case of one form symmetries. I don't understand this. Maybe somebody can explain it to me later. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. He didn't really talk about it. He was here. But he talked about supersymmetric gauge theories. Yeah. It's a shame because this is really interesting. Um, yeah, so maybe maybe this is a special case. So uh, this paper is by, I can't remember all the other authors. Cyberg, Kapustin, Willett, someone else. Gaiotto, really? Yeah, it must be Gaiotto. <laughs> Does he have the record for most pages posted to the archive in a week? We were discussing that last week. I think that must be the case. I think so, yeah. It's, yeah, OK. Um, anyway, uh, OK. OK, this is. All right, so case four is a Fermi surface. So this is a really dramatic kind of gaplessness that we're explaining here. That's that's what I was explaining here, and um, you know I described this this picture of how this particular state is gapless, and it has lots of gapless degrees of freedom. Right? It's really floppy, but the, th the thing I didn't explain, which is very important, is that not only is it gapless, but it's also stable. So so this is you know, despite the thing this thing I'm saying about about. If your Hamiltonian mixes the degenerate states, it'll lift the degeneracy. The reason, basically, is that is a kinematical reason. 
that the matrix elements of any local Hamiltonian between these degenerate states of those uh, quasi-particles near the Fermi surface basically vanish for kinematical reasons. Basically because if you want to scatter some of these guys to some of these other guys, this is a terrible picture, um, basically the filled states in here get in the way. Let me, let me leave it at that for now. Maybe we'll say more about that in the last section. Uh, and so here it's really a remarkable phenomenon, which I think, uh, I think whose full generality is not understood. Maybe we can think more about this. OK. Um, this is the only example in this table where the gapless degrees of freedom live at more than a point in momentum space. Um, OK, case five is the edge of a topological insulator. Oh, that's a word I should have said over there. Uh, so I'm making a distinction between these two things here, this case of topological order and this case of edge modes, which is the subject of topological insulators. And um, there's some evil people that, that try to conflate these two things um, and confuse us, but I think it's very important to keep these things distinct because they're very, they're very distinct. This, uh, this can be realized by free fermions, and this cannot. Topological order is much more interesting. OK. Uh, case six, so now we're getting into the dregs here, is a CFT with no relevant operators. Which I don't know if that's realized in anywhere. Uh, there are some examples in two dimensions, but I don't know if there's any physical realization of them. <laughs> Sorry? No, that has a relevant operator. No, that's, that's this case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, here there's nothing to tune, is what I'm saying. Right? It's, it's like a magical, isolated beast. <laughs> that's this case. <laughs> um, true. Ah, OK, OK. Yeah, you're right. So, so that's a fair point. So this, this case may be realized for a reason, right, which is this. Yeah, so I guess I was, th yeah, fair enough, fair enough. OK, I agree. Uh, let's put a question mark here. Um, all right, so that's the end of my list. If anybody has any, any items to add to this list, I would very much like to know them. Yes, please. Okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, okay. That's this case. That's this case. Then there's nothing gap. Oh, 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 oh. Hmm, yes, you're right. Yeah, fair enough, okay, okay. Yeah, you're right, actually. Um, okay, good, 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 good. All right, so I, I'm reluctant to mess too much with my list, but okay. While in while we're in the in the dregs of the list here, I, I will add supersymmetry. Um, and yeah, okay. I see unbroken Carl symmetry does prevent fermions from getting a mass. Um, I'm trying to explain it away, but I think you're right. Okay. All right. I, let's. Yeah, that's that's a better reason than these. So that's six, and then no, sorry, seven, and then eight, and then okay, good, I agree. Uh, Carl symmetry. Good, thank you. Anybody else? That's 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 pretty good luck so far. I don't know. All right, all right. Let's. Uh, okay, so. Uh, there are a few refinements of this list that I, want, that I need to mention. Uh, the first one is by symmetry, uh, which I guess I've already kind of, kind of said. Uh, here, let's maybe put, put it in this box here. Uh, refinement by symmetry. Um, which is, uh, suppose we have some Suppose we restrict our attention to some subspace of the space of all Hamiltonians, 
which, which commute with some symmetry. So you, know, you tell me some symmetry group that you like and how it acts on that Hilbert space. And then we restrict our attention to the only the Hamiltonians which commute that, with that symmetry. And then there are two questions we can ask. Well, uh, how does it act on H? So, so given uh, demanding that G commutes with H, so G is some uh, collection of generators of the symmetry, we can ask how does it act on H in the sense of what, are, what representations appear? Does it act on one side at a time? And, uh, uh, and is it broken by the vacuum? Um, So is, is there or is there not spontaneous symmetry breaking? Um, and included in this entry here is some tricky business, which uh, is the lattice version of anomalies, which uh, has, has uh, received a lot of attention uh, in the condensed matter literature recently, and is the subject of, uh, is part of the subject of section four there, which may, maybe I'll talk about it. We'll see, I'm feeling kind of down on it right now. Um, OK, and then there's one more refinement, another, another uh, uh, quantity which is correlated with, with this axis, which is the amount of entanglement. Um, so more entanglement means more desperation. And what I mean by, by entanglement here, uh, I guess you've had two series of lectures about entanglement already. So maybe I don't even need to write down the formula for the von Neumann entropy. Is it true? You guys all know what that is. It's okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right. Good. So here, but so but I need to specify which bipartition of the Hilbert space I am speaking of, and so here I mean the general situation we're going to consider. We're going to talk about it a lot. Is um, huh, we're going to have to have some erasing. Is uh, uh, oh, you know what? I'll try it here. I'll try it here. I'll try it here. Um, is some spatial bipartition where I pick some subregion of my system. I'll, I'll call it A, just like I called every other quantity. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it has some, some linear size R. And I will ask about uh, the reduced density matrix of, of that subsystem in the ground state. And uh, um, uh, OK. And its dependence on, on this quantity R is a strong characterization of uh, how much entanglement there is in the ground state. And in particular, uh, uh, um, for most of these cases, there, there is an area law, meaning that that entanglement, the amount of entanglement, is dominated by this bit, the bit that is between just neighboring patches of sod. And there are some interesting violations of that that we'll talk about. OK. Um, but the important point that I want to say here is, uh, the reason, the reason to care about the to this entanglement for the purposes of this discussion is, is that if the degrees of freedom, if these degrees of freedom making up our, our sod molecules were not entangled with each other, then we could use mean field theory. We could treat each sod molecule on its own and think about its experience. Right? Think, about, uh, think about it as living in a bath provided by the other sod molecules, which is just, per, just it just makes a, some effective action for, that, for the particular sod molecule. We could treat it classically, basically. And, we're, and that's called mean field theory. It means that the ground state is a product state. And uh, that's to be contrasted with the case where um, the state of the full system is entangled. That means that it's not possible to speak of the state of a single system on its own. Because it doesn't have a state on its own. It's entangled. That's what it means for it to be entangled. OK, and so um, my point here is that more entanglement means mean field theory is more wrong. And it means that there's more room for interesting things to happen, and also more desperation. OK. Um, yeah, so I guess yeah, so mean field theory is sort of a solved problem from the point of view of the you know, experiment-free study of condensed matter physics that, I'm, that we're taking here. <laughs> Though, of course, it's very interesting in the real world. Um, OK. All right. All right, that's the end of my sweeping introduction. Does anybody have any sweeping questions? So that we're, now we're going get, to get to work uh, thinking about gauge theory and condensed matter. 
maybe it's a good time for erasing. Um, so the first thing I want to do is is give a, an attempt at a clear physics definition of topological order. Um, and the physics definition is very simple, actually. It's uh, it's just deconfined gauge theory. It means gauge theory. This is, I think, just redistributing the chunk. <laughs> <laughs> To, to wet the, of the water and yeah. to Ooh. use the sponge and then squeezing it off. And Raphael did that. And that actually works if you're willing to do it. It makes it nice and clean and you can write immediately after you squeegee. Squeegee. There's oh, this is. <laughs> all right, I see. I see. I know this word. Yes. Okay. I've been to the Bronx. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see. No? Squeegee. All right. Let's test this. Uh-oh, I broke the squeegee. All right, let's test this, this, this conjecture here. All right, that's pretty good. OK, so equals deconfined sort of necessarily emergent gauge theory. So this has the uh, you know misfortune of being a physics definition. Uh, because now we need to understand what that is. Um, but it has some very sharp consequences uh, in, the, in, the partic in the special case of gap systems. So notice I, I, haven't, uh, uh, restricted to the I haven't restricted this definition to the case of systems with a gap. Uh, but when there is a gap, it has some very sharp consequences, which are much better understood. <sighs> OK, so with a gap, this implies the following. Uh, three closely interrelated things. Thing one is fractionalization of quantum numbers. Okay, so that is if, suppose our, our microscopic system has some symmetry, like say rotation invariance or some global symmetry or uh, uh, electric, electric charge. Um, that the microscopic constituents carry some representation of that symmetry, like say they're charge one electrons, uh, then in a state with topological order, it is possible for the low energy excitations, the, the quasi-particle excitations, the excitations which are described by this dispersion curve here, uh, to have quantum numbers which are fractions of, of, of the quantum numbers of the microscopic constituents. And this includes also uh, 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 so spin, charge, and also statistics. Uh, statistics. Is that how you spell that word? Yeah. Um, uh, which is, I guess, most dramatically possible in uh, uh, 2 plus 1d. Um, though it is possible to turn bosons into fermions. Um, okay, and this, this uh, I'll say more about this, but uh, this generally comes with a further consequence, which is that gr topological ground state degeneracy I mentioned. Ground state degeneracy, uh, which depends on the topology of space. Of space. So here I really mean you take the system and you put it on a Riemann surface of so genus G, and the number of ground states depends on the genus. Um, this sounds like a crazy thing to imagine trying to do, but there are actually some pretty realistic proposals to do it now by Mason Brakeshley and Xiao Uh Now, they, ha they actually have some good reasons to do it besides just, you know, because I want them you know, to be able to do <laughs> I want this to be realistic. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, why is this a con so? I claim that this is actually a consequence of this one, and uh, here's the idea for why that's true. So here's a picture of. Okay, I'll I'll draw a boring one-hole donut, and uh, this is a picture of space, and uh, I'm drawing it embedded in this way rather than like that because I want to emphasize the um, uh, the conjugate nature of the two cycles. Uh, the two one cycles. So uh, think about the following uh, process. 
So we so so imagine real living on this donut is is a system with topological order which has some some fractional uh, quasi particles. Uh, so and put it in its vacuum, and now imagine exciting the system a little bit by pair creating one of these quasi particles and its antiparticle. Just you know in a little patch there. So that's some some operator that I'm acting with, and now. Uh, slowly drag one of them all the way around one of these things until it gets to there and then annihilate them again. Okay, so this whole th this whole process is described by an operator which has support on this curve that I've drawn here. And uh, uh, furthermore, there are good reasons to believe that the process puts you back in the space of ground states. So this defines some operator which, let me call it, I don't know, F sub X if this direction is x. Uh, and I claim that this takes a ground state to another ground state, maybe not the same one. Uh, maybe they could be the same ones. But now, uh, here's, here's the magic. We can, we can t take another kind of quasi-particle, maybe the same kind, maybe not, and uh, create one and its anti-particle, and then move them around this other conjugate cycle. And the important property of the, these two cycles is that they intersect once at a point. And uh, this defines another operator, which I don't know, let me call it f sub y. And the fact that these, these particles can have funny mutual statistics uh, means that these two things don't commute. And they both take ground states to ground states. and you know, in examples, there's some particular algebra, which is, you know, you get some phase here or something like this. And so the ground states have to form an irreducible representation of this algebra, whatever it is. I haven't told you what it is. But in general, that can be more than one dimensional. Okay, so we'll talk about an example forthwith. Uh, uh, and so this, the space of ground states for necessarily is more than one dimensional because it has to form a representation of that algebra. So that's the sense in which this follows from this. And then finally, there's a third consequence, which also follows from, which one does it follow from? It follows from this, which is long range entanglement. Um, and what do I mean by that? It's a little bit hard to define this precisely. Um, I'll, Actually, in, in section three, I think it is, in the section about entanglement normalization, I can give a precise definition of what this is not. I can give a sharp definition of short range entanglement. Um, but basically, it means that uh, if you look at the entanglement entropy of, of a region like this, there's a contribution which uh, cares not just about the local physics near the boundary, so a contribution beyond just the, the area law term, which, uh, for example, could be a term which is independent of the size. Um, so uh, actually, in, in this context, I, I, maybe this is a sharp statement. Uh, it says that the entanglement entropy of a subsystem like that has an area law term. Uh, that's r to the d minus 1. d is the number of space dimensions over some cutoff times some horrible non-universal coefficient, and then minus this golden, beautiful, extra constant contribution, uh, which is called the topological entanglement entropy. And uh, uh, notice it's something which, it's, it's, it's independent of r, is the important point. And uh, uh, let me show you that such a term cannot arise from uh, entanglements just across the boundary. Um, so this argument is due to uh, Grover, Zhang, and Vishwanath. OK, let us erase this. OK, I'm going to try again. The trick seems to be to not destroy the tools. Oh, it's time to stop. Oh, I'm having so much fun. OK, uh, I'll, I'll erase this board, I'll explain that statement, and then I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me honest. OK. Ooh. 
Yeah, I bet you could like rubber band them together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me explain that statement. Um, so, um, okay, the idea is if uh, the system is short range entangled, that is an antonym of long range entanglement, then I must be able to account for the entanglement entropy of a subregion by adding up little bits. That is, I could cover the space in little balls. You know, maybe they, they can be bigger than the balls can be bigger than the correlation length. Um, and I should be able to get the whole thing from just adding up those little balls. And that means I should be able to write this as an integral over the boundary of A of some like entropy density functional, entanglement entropy density. Let's call it L dl. And the question is just what is what possible form can this have? And well, it we have to be able to make it out of local quantities like the the curvature of the shape of the boundary. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. And so this has the form, in terms of the L, a constant bit. So this is some constant. It's like the, this is like the cosmological constant term. Then there's an extrinsic curvature term. And that has a coefficient, called that B. And then there's a, you know, you can have a K squared. And I think basically all you can have is more powers of the extrinsic curvature. And I guess I've written in this, maybe, have I specified the 2 plus 1 dimensions? I guess by writing dl I have. Um, the argument doesn't, isn't special to 2, to two plus 1 dimensions so much. Um, but then, OK, so then if we, um, we can do this integral. Uh, mm -hmm. OK, and the answer is, this gives the area law term. So L of dA is the, this is, you know, this is what I call the R to the d minus 1, um, the length of the boundary. And this, this term is what give, would give a constant. This is B, I don't know, let's call it B twiddle. It's proportional to B. The extrinsic curvature term is what would give a constant. And then this term gives something which falls off like the size. So this gives C twiddle over the length and so on. Right, so this is like a derivative expansion of this fictional <laughs> entropy density functional. And then the point is the following. In a pure state of the whole system, the entropy of A is equal to the entropy of its complement. Because right, the whole system is in a pure state. Yeah? OK, yeah, some nodding? OK, but, but now. In this calculation, there's this orientation, right? So the, you know, I'm doing this integral with this. The extrinsic curvature comes with a sign, sign, s i g n. And in the calculation of s of a bar, k becomes minus k. It's pretty cool because that means that in a pure state, this has to vanish. So this has to vanish. And so under this assumption, short range entangled implies gamma equals zero. So the only way to get this contribution is if there's some extra kind of entanglement, which is not just short ranged. Okay, so that's uh, that's what I mean by topological order. Those are some sharp consequences of it in the gap case, and I guess next time we're going to start with uh, an example, which is quantum Hall states. Okay. Maybe you could, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Questions yeah, more questions, more questions. We'll have a question period also in the afternoon. Oh, at what time?
Oh, uh, yeah, so I, I, was, I was wrong about that initially. I mean, it's, so I'm just naming n, but I wanted to make it match with the answer from A to C of T. Oh, okay. Where, right, so where the n, n squared is, n is the number of colors okay, of yeah, the gauge yeah. theory. Yeah, I can make it.